Welcome everyone uh, to the Center for Critical Thinking webinar on rising income inequality in America. This is one of a series of webinars you can find on the CCT website and our YouTube channel as well. I'm Alan Van Eggman and I'll serve as moderator uh, for this session. Throughout our history, income inequality has been a recurring feature of America's way of life. In theory, this has been mitigated by the perception that our nation is one of opportunity and economic expansion raises the fortunes of all segments of our country. Therefore, income inequality has not always been perceived as a serious form of economic injustice. However, in recent years, it appears that the increasing concentration of wealth, unless checked, will become an enduring structural feature of our transforming economy. Furthermore, serious divisions in the economic well being of Americans are now being exacerbated by the adverse impact of COVID 19 and related pandemic issues. This is causing rising unemployment, widespread dislocation, and enduring poverty, particularly among more vulnerable groups. Well, what does this mean for the future of our country and our way of life? Does the growing disparity between the haves and have nots constitute a serious threat to our already polarized society? Is capitalism itself now on trial? Also, are economic factors contributing to the rise of violent extremism among populations who feel increasingly estranged and marginalized? What can be done to reverse these current trends? Well, we are fortunate to have a noted speaker and fellow CCT board member, Dr. Charles Kupchella, help us better understand the various dimensions and implications of rising income inequality in America. Dr. Kupchella's distinguished career as an educator and president of the University of North Dakota were featured in the background for today's webinar. Dr. Kupchella will offer some ideas on, a, on how to help mitigate the most harmful aspects of the problem. And then he will also provide some thoughts about a way forward to secure a better future for us all. Dr. Kupchella, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alan. I'm going to get my slides up here and put us over in the corner. There we go. Well, <clears throat> um, the, the background you may have read about in the, prep in the materials leading into this program described me as a uh, biologist. And I should take a moment, I think, to explain how I made it all the way to economics, uh, the topic uh, that we're on here today. <clears throat> My career began in the, oh, the, the, the area of physiology and biophysics cancer research, cellular research. And as I went through my career, I became more and more general. And for a long time, worked in what I would call uh, the environmental side of biological science. That is where we look at the interface between human beings and the environment. So from cancer as a cellular problem to cancer as a, an environmental problem and how humans get along with one another, which is actually an ecological problem. And then from there to even edgier things like um, where morality comes from and human evolution. So where biology comes up against uh, some of the more interesting things about us as a particular species. Um, now economics, and of course economics has been called the dismal science. Uh, I don't I personally don't think it's a science at all. It's a, it has very few testable hypotheses as a basis for the for the discipline. It's usually rife with all kinds of political overtones and ideology kind of built in. So I kind of think of it as more like a religion with differential equations uh, than I do as a uh, as a hard science. <clears throat> President Harry Truman once said, "I need some." one-armed economist to advise me because every time I try to get some advice from an economist, uh, they tell me something and then say, on the other hand, 
and describe something that's almost uh, uh, the opposite. So <clears throat> uh, I'm going to persuade you in the next half hour or so that um, this, uh, this problem of income inequality is much more of a biological problem than it is an economic one. In fact, the, the book that you saw in the materials uh, in front of this uh, program by, uh, uh, on the, the broken ladder, uh, he actually calls it a public health uh, problem. One of my other bona fides, by the way, is that I grew up in, this is President Lyndon Johnson here, of course, during the war on poverty. And I grew up in that county right there in Pennsylvania, which is part of the Appalachian, uh, part of the, the problem in Appalachia with, uh, with uh, poverty. So here we go. Um, so definitions to begin. Um, a lot of these words are used interchangeably, but they're not equivalent. Um, inequality, inequity is actually something as I'm going to use it and as most people do, it means something unfair, that where the playing field is not level, where there's probably some problem at work that we need to correct. Whereas inequality, disparity, they're all equivalent to difference. Uh, sometimes a difference is okay. Uh, but yeah, one of the main the themes I'm gonna be talking about today is how inequality <clears throat> can actually be a problem even if it is fair, if it's big enough. It actually stands as a problem by itself when it gets too large. Here are some of the components of what we could call economic inequality, more broadly speaking. It's income, it's net worth, it's housing, clothing, food insecurity, environmental quality problems, air, water, land, uh, differential opportunity, different ability to get health care, differential quality of life, and it all kind of converges on this thing called political power, where we find people at the bottom of the income scale have now very, very little of it. And it's part of the problem I'm going to address today. There is plenty of inequality and inequity in our world. And we're going to start with the world. Uh, these pictures are heart wrenching and I could, I could show you thousands of them. And they all depict the same thing, a world in which, uh, well, half of the world lives on $5 and 50 cents a day. 1.3 billion of the 8 billion almost people on earth today live on less than $1.90 a day. And by the way, $1.90 a day is considered extreme poverty. When we talk about countries like the United States and other Western countries, we actually switch kind of magically to something called relative poverty. And that's a, easily defined by you take the median income for a country and poverty is anything below one half of that number. So it's quite different than a dollar 90. So we'll, we'll be mixing these up as we go along today. 750 million people lack adequate access to clean water. Another 270 million children have no access to health services. Nearly a billion people entered the 21st century, one out of every eight people or nine, unable to read and write. It's a very sad situation, obviously a very large problem. And I'm not even going to get into areas like um, sexual uh, trafficking and other forms of exploitation that come with uh, this inequality. Here are some of the poorest countries of the world. You can see them there expressed as a function of gross domestic product per capita. Most of the poorest countries in the world are in Africa. <clears throat> and you see the top five or the lowest five in comparison to the United States of America, which in which uh, the gross domestic product per capita is 100 times larger than it is in a country like the Congo. world poverty. And a lot of it in, in the world, of course, gets right down to food insecurity, where people don't even have enough to eat, which is extreme. Um, 
60 to 80 percent of the income uh, in developing countries uh, go for food, whereas we spend somewhere around 10 percent, depending on how you count it. There are over 800 million people in the world who are hungry every day. They go to bed hungry. They wake up hungry. Now, more than 3 million children die from malnutrition every year. Trends. Um, the number of people living on less than $1.90 a day dropped by half from 1990 to 2010. And it continued to drop until uh, just about uh, a year ago when the COVID hit. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, while this low limit of 190 per day dropped, um, inequity actually got larger. That is the difference between the poor and the very rich was getting larger all the time that the uh, level of poverty was actually uh, coming up. So extreme poverty rose in 2020 for the first time in over 20 years as COVID-19 and the pandemic compounded what you see here, conflict and climate change, which were already working, already working to make the problem worse. And then if you look at inequity itself, that is the, the, the difference between the richest and the most poor. Now the richest 1% of people in the world hold more wealth than all of the other people in the world combined. The world's richest 42 people in 2018 had more wealth than the poorest 3.7 billion people on our planet. Roughly 80% of the wealth generated in the world last year went to just 1%. Over the next 20 years, 500 of the world's richest people will give $2.4 trillion to their heirs. And that's not a trivial number, 2.4 trillion is about the GDP of India. So uh, that's over, that is uh, over a uh, 20 year period, of course. There's a new billionaire that arrives on the planet every two days, and there are now 2,000 billionaires on Earth. Their first trillionaire is going to be coming soon. Uh, billionaire wealth went up before COVID by 13% uh, that year, right before 2019. For others, it went up by only 2%. Uh, this this uh, disparity from top to bottom, difference from top to bottom, is, is worldwide, about the same in every part of the country, a little, the Middle East, a little higher than some. Now, unsurprisingly, these are the least equal countries in the world by a thing called the Gini coefficient. It's a measure of uh, the difference between how rich the rich are and how poor the poor are. The bigger the number, the closer to one, at one, the, the, the function works this way, at one, Everybody, one person has all the money. At zero, it's equally distributed across all people. Everybody has the same amount. And of course, the reason the most unequal countries in the world are in the poorest parts of the world, because the people, most of the people are very, very poor. Obviously, there are two ways to get to a large Gini coefficient. One is to have the rich be very, very, very rich. And the other is to have the poor be very, very, very poor. It's a difference we're talking about from top to bottom. America, by almost any measure, is one of the has, has one of the largest uh, levels of poverty in the world. And I want to show you some pictures. And notice none of these people, all of these people, are white people. Poverty is is something that you find almost everywhere. Uh, in parts of in, in, in certain parts, obviously more than others, but we have homeless. We have uh, people living on just barely surviving in lots of places. It's kind of the other America, if you will. People who have little or no health care, um, and and because of the COVID uh, issue now, uh, we have people that live in. Houses like you see on the right here, who, who are now in lines to get food. And this problem of what's happening at the bottom, where all of the impact is apparently being felt, is really, really exacerbating this uh, difference in income 
because jobs are being large jobs are being lost, and um, the amount of pay people are making is stagnant uh, if it's if it's moving at all. A big relationship with healthcare. This goes beyond money, of course. At the, on the right, you see the Mayo Clinic. On the left, if people have any, some people, if they have any access to healthcare at all here in America, it's through a free clinic of some kind. And of course, uh, healthcare translates into lifespan. There's a direct correlation between wealth and your expectation of living. We don't have to look very far here to see great, great differences in this, in the great disparity between the haves and the have nots. It is a huge, huge uh, thing here in the United States. Here's income inequality. The lowest fifth of our population makes about 3.1% of all income. You can see here the top one fifth makes more than half. And the top 5% actually uh, has one quarter of all American income. Where does the US fit on this Gini coefficient? Well, with the developed countries, which you see in this uh, slide, including China, you know, the great, the great uh, socialist uh, paradise, uh, which has an even greater level of inequality. Of course, in China, it has mostly to do with very, 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 lots of people at the very, very bottom. But you can see here that we are one of the most unequal countries in the, in the developed world on this chart right here. There, there is a greater difference between top and bottom here than in all other Western countries and China. Now embedded in all of this in a, in a subject we're not really going to address except in, right here uh, today is the, the disparities that are really in equities. They are not fair. They need to be addressed. Um, I'm showing on the, on the left chart here, this is racial wealth inequality, which is rampant in the US. This is going from 1983 to 2024 projected, obviously. This is how much uh, the uh, median household wealth by white for white folks is and will be expected to be. And then down here, you see the median household wealth for uh, Latinos uh, in the brown color and for uh, blacks in the in the red color. If you start with a, with some people or the people in 1943 uh, and follow them, let's say they were they were those who were born between 43 and 51, uh, and and take their average uh, family wealth over time. Uh, I guess you can see that over time. The wealth for black families doesn't change very much, even though all the gains that we've made with equality in this country, here's wealth for uh, white folks. And we know that throughout our population, still a very big problem, even though slavery ended 150 years ago, uh, it is a racial uh, uh, discrimination problem uh, embedded in our culture still today. There have been job application studies that have shown whites get picked over blacks for the same job with equal qualification. They get better deals when they buy, a, a, a white folks get better deals when they buy cars, when they buy homes. There have been studies of who gets death sentences. Uh, and again, just, to, just for emphasis, white households had 91% of American wealth in 1990, and they had 86% last year. And look at this. This shows a rising tide that everybody, well, people talk about sometimes, uh, not everybody, but some do. Um, we've been doing better um, over time. Well, look at this. Who does the best? It's those in the 90th percentile. You can see this is how their incomes per person rose from 1970 to 2016. This was the median group, so the 50th percentile. And these are people at the 10th percentile. So they, that hasn't changed. The, the amount of household income hasn't changed much. For the middle group, it's changed some. But where it's really changed 
proves or shows very clearly that the rich do get richer in our uh, country. Here's a way to view it on a, uh, a chart. I'm gonna move this up again. Uh, this is in 2018 dollars. Uh, this is from 1970 to 2018. This is how the bottom 50% moved. If you just look at these corners, this group moved from 19,000 a year and after tax uh, and transfer uh, payments, uh, if they were getting some kind of federal uh, support from 19 to 27. So not even a, well, ba barely a 50% increase. Whereas in the top one tenth of 1%, the average income went from 3.6 million to 24.178 million during that same period of time. This is a six fold increase. This is a barely a two, not even a two uh, fold increase. So it's been uneven. 3%, three uh, richest Americans have more wealth than the entire half of the American population. And what makes some of this unfair is that it takes money to make money. As you all know, the Supreme Court ruled not long ago that money is actually a form of speech and therefore you can spend it as much as you want to get a political objective of yours accomplished. It's tilted the, the political paying field, playing field. And the, and the whole set of it, some of it's legitimate um, and I call it legal and illegal corruption. Uh, an example recently uh, on one of the, uh, the national news aggregation services pointed out that when Airbnb went as an initial public offering, the investment banks made it available, but only to the big institutional investors. And the next day, uh, of course, the stock was worth way more. And it showed how just overnight by restricting who, who could buy the stock on A1, a white hot stock, that group of investors made 3.9 billion just by waiting uh, one day. Uh, Robin Hood and, and uh, some of those mom and pop uh, uh, services for buying stock were, did not have access to the stock. Today, the uh, CEOs make um, one make 360 times more money than the average uh, worker. And you could say, and some argue this is perfectly fine, but I'm just pointing out not everybody feels that way. 360 times what the average worker makes seems kind of excessive. And it led Robert Reich, who used to be a secretary of labor. He worked in two, one Republican and one Democratic uh, administration not long ago. He said the moral crisis of our age um, is insider training, obscene CEO pay, wage theft from ordinary workers, Wall Street's gambling addiction, corporate payoffs to friendly politicians, and billionaire takeovers of democracy. Uh, opportunity has a lot to do with what you see in the dollar numbers. This is a very telling figure. It shows this part of the graph right here, if you just focus on it, it's low income people. This was their score on, in the, on an eighth grade uh, college admissions test or college admissions test. They either scored low, middle or high, all right? Um, <clears throat> what percentage of them then got into and completed college? Well, 29% of those in the lowest uh, group here did. Uh, they, had, they were the ones with the highest scores and it matches, go across here, those in the high income group who had the lowest scores. Now, it's just telling that the playing field isn't quite level. Where this differential opportunities began, how it developed is of course something uh, we could discuss. But having a college degree is obviously a very important uh, indicator. This graph shows income levels for high school, uh, some high schools, high school graduates, and those with a bachelor's degree uh, in the age group 18 to 24. The more education you have, the more money you make. Uh, a word here about a group of 
Americans who have really taken big hits lately. And it's the lower side of the middle class. Um, people that use, especially the group that you see sometimes in polls, they refer to a cohort, a, uh, a demographic group called non-college educated white males. Now, those are the guys, many of them I grew up with, uh, had jobs in steel mills, uh, the coal mines. They made good money. Uh, all of a sudden, they see the world, their world falling apart. The jobs are disappearing. They all moved someplace. Um, the, the, some of them have gone on to college, but it's actually women who are going to college now at a much greater rate than and man, this has continued on. This was this was a number of years ago uh, when this graph was uh, shown. But you know, when I went to college, uh, males dominated uh, college student uh, the profile. I think about four to one back in those days, and now it's sixty-one percent projected to be sixty-one percent women. So every place these guys look, they see immigrants coming into the United States. They see um, African-Americans all of a sudden in jobs that they couldn't get into before. They say women, they're competing more with uh, women. They're seeing their jobs going overseas. Um, so the effect of that is that over time, since 1960, 1967 in this graph, till 2017, you can see what's happened as who has the biggest share or what share of U.S. household a total income. So the high income group, that's $100,000 or more, not even very high anymore, uh, went from 9% of the population in 67 to 30%. But notice this group actually got smaller. Uh, went from 53.8 in 1967 down to 41. So a drop of 10%. Uh, this is for the whole middle group here. Uh, but it's the lower part of that group. Uh, and I'll show you another graph, but this one shows in another way um, how um, the middle class is now shrinking as a, uh, as a, uh, as a percentage. What's causing all this? Well, <clears throat> this shows, by the way, another way of looking at it. This is middle class share of income from 1967 to 2012 in this particular slide, the blue line. The share of income going to the middle class. This red line here shows union membership uh, declining. It's not the only factor. I mean, how, how would union uh, membership affect uh, income? Well, there, the workers are losing their power, uh, political and otherwise. Uh, the other factors would include technology, which is replacing workers. Uh, jobs are going to Mexico, China. We used to make furniture. We used to make uh, textiles, uh, automobiles. They've all gone, or many of them have gone, uh, some of them completely. <clears throat> and even those that remain have to stand the force of uh, foreign competition. And then, of course, affix the minimum wage. Now, <clears throat> over history or throughout history, there have been points where the stress caused by differences in income have led to, in these two pictures, the, the French Revolution <clears throat> and the Russian Revolution. But what I want to tell you about during the rest of my time here uh, today is that even when everybody has enough to eat, and maybe even when most people have a, nice, a fairly nice place to stay, if the playing field isn't level, and if the difference between the top and the bottom is too large, it causes stresses. This book is what I'm recommending to you. It's how inequality, it doesn't say inequity. It's just how a difference top to bottom affects the way we think, live, and die. <clears throat> and it's a metaphor of ladders. The ladder is broken. Um, this was from an article a number of years ago, in the, uh, a couple of years ago, in 
a Wall Street Journal, and it explained how women, even though they were coming into the workforce, they weren't, and, and they were up until the time a, a worker might be asked to sit and serve on the lowest rung of the management ladder. Um, women were not getting to go on that first rung. Men were, so they, they climbed. So even though you, you control for things like ability, this was another issue, of course, uh, gender equity. Um, but it, it, it served to make the point that ladders have to have uh, rings that are sort of evenly spaced and that everybody has a chance to get on the one at the bottom in order to eventually get on the one at the top. So Keith Payne and I are going to make this case now that uh, even though great social tension comes if lots of people don't have enough to eat and don't have enough place to sleep and don't have a place in the grand social scheme, the problem is that we human beings need to feel like we're part of our social group. We are, we are shaped and formed by evolution to be part of a collaborative group as a social group. We have to have, each of us has to have status. Most of us want to see, almost all of us want to see ourselves somewhere in the middle or above the middle. 92% uh, of college professors when they're asked would say they're above average in their effectiveness as a teacher. It's, it's what Garrison Peter called the Lake Wobegon effect. We have to see ourselves somewhere in play. Um, what happens when we don't? Well, at the extreme, we have crime, we have disease, we have blight, we have riots and insurrection, and we have extremism. <clears throat> and so even in these extremes, we have something that affects everybody, even those who are in the top one-tenth of one percent and, and would seem otherwise safely above the fray. So hyper inequality is a problem for our hyper social species. We are built to need to be in on whatever our group is up to. We need to be part of it all. We need to belong. We need to have status. And it explains why a poor kid in the ghetto might kill somebody for a pair of shoes. We hear that story all the time. I might not have anything, but I've got to have these shoes. It's, it's going to show that I'm part of the, that I have a place and it's somewhere up there in the, uh, and not at the bottom. <clears throat> An example that uh, um, is used in the book, uh, The Broken Ladder, um, is an airplane. And it, it, it's a story about trains, airplanes, and air rage, and a thing called status hierarchy. And the book is full of studies and observations of things that go on in our world. And in this particular case, they look to see uh, in an airplane, which is kind of a, almost, a, almost a model of social hierarchy status if the, section, if the airplane has a first class section. Okay, you, you, you've been on an airplane, you know, when you are on coach, you come on the airplane and you go through first class. They're already seated. They usually already have a drink and you go right by them to your coach seat. But what they found in these studies, and all that is okay, it's not, not the issue. Everybody on the plane is probably, probably doing okay economically. It's just the idea that there's this diff, disparate, this different. And they found in this, their study that airplanes that have a first class section have four times the incidence of air range, they call it as airplanes that do not have a first class section where there's just one class for seating. And they found that if people come on the plane, not through first class, uh, but through the side door to get into the coach section, then uh, it's only twice as high. But, but the, the, uh, the degree of air range in planes that have first class, uh, the increase is about the same as you see when there's a, about a nine hour delay in your flight. So somebody studied all this and said, you know, what's going on is people are being made aware that they're not measuring up some way to other people. And it's a, and for them, it's a, it's a problem. 
those in the bottom from the middle down see that as a great big problem because it's kind of like the train metaphor where you're sitting on a train and it's not going anywhere, it's stopped. But the train next to yours is going backwards all of a sudden. You get the feeling that your train is going forward. Well, I'm, what I'm here to tell you is a lot of Americans, especially now with this COVID thing and its impact on this lower stratum in our economic system, um, it's, it's causing uh, a, a great deal of stress in our society. Um, the author of the book, Broken Ladder, actually does a lot of comparisons across states. These are the states of the United States, you recognize right away, that uh, are ranked by color and by Gini rating. The dark green means a high degree of, of difference between top to bottom. Uh, red is the very highest, so New York is the most unequal state of our 50 states. And Utah is the most uh, egalitarian, the least difference top to bottom. And what they find is things like this. Uh, people in the states where, this, where the disparity is greatest. Now, it's not where income is greatest necessarily, because they control for that. It's not, it's not uh, that there's a correlation between being poor. It's a correlation between it's a correlation between the things you see here and any and the degree of inequality. The more inequality in a geographical unit, whether it's a state, whether it's a province, or whether it's a country, the lifespans are shorter, illness derived from risky behavior are greater, there are more teenage births, there's more school dropouts, and greater is misspelled, but it's a greater economic mobility actually in states. Uh, there's actually less economic ability. That's, uh, it's a, that's a misprint. There's less economic ability, uh, in, uh, economic mobility in states that, uh, that are uh, uh, inequitable. Feeling poor and acting poor is about the same as it is for those who actually are poor, according to the author uh, of the, uh, uh, broken ladder. I'm going to skip this and come back to it if there's a question about sports teams. What, e what inequality does to people who are below the 20th percentile is create more anxiety, more depression, people thinking something must be wrong with me, especially now with the COVID thing, a sense of losing, a sense of moving backward. Um, it makes people short-sighted. This, this, there are lots of studies cited in this book that shows very clearly people are, are apt to make short-term payoff, short-term gratification decisions. They opt for high-risk behavior, gambling, binge drinking, and binge eating. They're inclined to believe in conspiracies like QAnon and you name it. Uh, they, they're looking, people, in addition to being uh, absolutely in need of being part of a group. They need to feel like there is order in the world. There's an explanation. If I'm not doing well, something is wrong. And you grab onto apparently the nearest conspiracy to give you an explanation and try to make order out of the world in which there isn't necessarily uh, very much of it. So believe in the supernatural, uh, make self-defeating uh, decisions. <clears throat> There's a couple of experiments I would cite here, but I'm watching my time and I want to make sure we just have a few minutes here for the end for uh, the way forward. What about general solutions and specific solutions? Now, I know some of you may not believe any of this. Uh, you think, well, of course, not everybody's equal. And I would agree. And anybody who ever looked at this knows that is true. We're not, I'm not talking about differences. There always will be differences. It's when they are too big that we have a problem. So we've known that for a long time, haven't we? We've done things like make mandatory public schooling and we pay for it. Uh, we have public higher education. We have standards for what parents have to do to take care of their children. We have workforce training programs. We have little league scouts. We, we do try to make a place for everybody in our society. And what I'm telling you here today is we're gonna to have to try harder. We've had policies to ensure that there's not much, there's nobody below the bottom. 
we do that through some combination of progressive taxation where we get some revenue and then transfer the money down and we use it for things like housing and energy subsidies. Uh, Jamie Dimon in a recent uh, issue of Time Magazine um, and the title of the article was How to Save Capitalism. Uh, you all know Jamie Dimon, perhaps uh, most of you do. He's CEO of the world's largest bank, so a, a capitalist, no, no doubt, uh, and apparently a very good one. He says we need to modify capitalism to make it more inclusive. We have to build our education system to make sure and bring everybody in they have a place, provide more and better skills training. Affordable health care is, is a must. Infrastructure investment, sensible immigration policies and climate policies, and all of that's for starters. The author of um, The Broken Ladder, Pain, has a few more. We need to compress the ladder. We have to make all the runs equally accessible to people with similar ability, regardless of race, gender, etc. We have to establish some kind of respectable bottom. Nobody goes hungry in America. Truncate the top, more rational CEO salaries and benefits. No missing rungs. Uh, maybe we have, we should see our uh, economy as one with several ladders that have levels with happy intermediate platforms perhaps. Um, but we, we've got to fix the, uh, the latter. And I would add for the discussion to follow here today, um, because of some of the sources of, of corruption and things that lead to inequity, unfairness, we need term limits for Congress. We need to revamp our campaign finance system to get uh, the money out of uh, politics. We need a more progressive tax rate on the extremities of wealth. We need perhaps to extend the earned income tax credit program because what it does is help people at the very near the bottom who have who actually have a job and we need to raise the minimum wage. And I have one more uh, slide. Uh, this is a topic right now. Should the minimum wage be raised to $15 an hour? Well, I know there's some pros and some cons about this topic. But I will say that in, in my estimation, nobody who works full time in America should be living in something called uh, poverty. And I know full well that what we're guaranteed by our constitution is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it's only the pursuit. The happiness isn't guaranteed, the pursuit is. So therefore, we must make sure that there is a good and fair chance for everybody to achieve a respectable level of happiness. So with that, I thank all of you for your attention and giving me this opportunity and the privilege uh, to make this presentation here today. I'll turn it back to, uh, to Alan. Thank you so much. What a, what a fascinating presentation and uh, a mixture of, uh, in, of facts and figures that seem relatively depressing and others that seem you know, like, uh, like there's hope. So uh, we have a number of questions. I think uh, uh, some of them you can just encapsulate in kind of the basic question in that you seem to feel, but, but please explain a little bit more that, that we can, it is possible to kind of move forward um, uh, within our capitalist system. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be, um, filled with people without hope and without any kind of, uh, uh, of opportunities for, for jobs and that sort of thing. Um, uh, and that uh, it, it's not, and particularly vis-a-vis -vis other countries as well, it's not our capitalist system per se that's generating these tremendous, um, tremendously adverse trends, but it's, it's fixable. Because normally you think of our society as a meritocracy, one where we can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and move them to the upper run uh, income levels. And what's not clear on some of your slides, a couple of observers have, have mentioned, is the degree to which some of the richest in the country have, re have been the richest from the very beginning or whether they've kind of gotten rich because of their own abilities and their own inventions and that sort of thing. 
Well, for me, Alan, <clears throat> it has to do with if you're going to have a country that works effectively and has prosperity and peace and it doesn't have people riding in the streets and people sleeping under bridges, those kinds of things, if it gets to that, and I know there are people that almost are refractory to help, that no amount of trying to get them into a, uh, a, a higher paying job is going to do it for them. But I'm trusting that it's a small percentage. There are more people that could be helped, I think, in our system. And the objective is simply to have a society in which uh, some of us are richer than others, fine. But we all want to, we all want to enjoy the benefits of whatever the, the society has delivered up for us. We have to make sure um, that at some minimal level, uh, we've taken care of giving everybody a chance to play and to be part of the system. As long as we don't, it's, it's, it's going to be, uh, the jails are going to be full and, and we're going to be talking about uh, criminal justice reform instead, spending probably three or four times more money to deal with it that way. So uh, another series of questions relates to um, the, the fact that it seems that as jobs have progressed, as tasks have become, you know, more complex and more difficult, even uh, that wages haven't kept up uh, with that. That they've sort of been stagnant, and that's one of the factors that may be per perhaps contributing to inequality as rather as well as inequity. Uh, and of course, we're capturing that these days in the debate about raising the minimum wage. And it seems to me that a lot of, um, of arguments against raising the min minimum wage don't necessarily relate to the fact that the minimum wage is not in need of raising, um, although it's argued that in some states, perhaps the costs of living are significantly lower than in other states. But, but the central issue is the impact on small and medium business, businesses. So how do you, how do you address that? Obviously, the problem is not simple, and there are arguments on, on both sides. I, I kind of go back to my uh, growing up days as a, mem as a member of a coal mining uh, family, uh, watching, uh, and then watching what's happened to my, uh, my state uh, in the 100 years since some of those mines are open. These coal companies did business. They, weren't, they didn't have to take into account the cost of making sure that the trout streams didn't get polluted with acid mine drainage. They just opened up the, 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 the valve and let the water flow in. So 100 years later, we now have people and taxpayers trying to restore these streams back in Pennsylvania that the coal companies didn't have to protect when they were doing their business. My point is that we have to find better ways to make sure that the real cost of a service, the real cost of a product, all of it, all of the rent, all of the, uh, every place where that goes is taken into account in making that product and selling it. And if you can't do that in a way that will let, will have people buy it, then that product should not be part of our economic system because it has to be paid for sooner or later by somebody. So a hamburger costs a little more if you pay a, a worker at McDonald's $15 an hour, then you pay that much for a hamburger. And the capitalist system will work well as it always has <clears throat> to find a way to, um, to have the winners come out uh, and they'll still be selling hamburgers. I've paid as much as, uh, you know, in, in certain, maybe at a ballpark. Uh, we, I, we often joke we play golf back in Pennsylvania at a small golf course and we get, uh, you get 18 holes, a cart and a hot dog for $25. And I, I joke that I paid that much for a hot dog at a ballpark. Point is, somehow the economic system has to be made to cover what it actually costs for people. It's not like, well, we only pay them $5, but 
then the government has to give them some money from another source to get them out of poverty. D do it right up there where the action is and make sure the products take care of, uh, <clears throat> take care of bringing the revenue in that, that, that covers it. Now I know I've made a big, it's a big leap from coal mines to hamburgers, but I hope that makes the point that, that uh, some way or other, we're gonna to have to take care of people send them a, an in, earned income tax allotment, uh, give them food stamps, or pay them $15 an hour to work at uh, McDonald's and then have a job instead. Um, it, it seems very clear to me. It's just not the details, obviously, aren't something that would be something I could describe, but I know that once you you put that system in place, we, we have the experiment, the experience now with Amazon. It's paying $15 an hour to its employees. They found that it's reduced their cost of recruiting people and the cost of uh, losing employees. Um, so there are benefits that come to companies. I know Amazon's not a small business, but um, I know there, there are studies that show states that have raised the minimum wage that are next to those that haven't. Uh, haven't uh, haven't seen some of what's thought to be the downside of uh, raising the minimum wage, even right on the border with states that don't have it. Nobody goes to New Jersey to buy or to Pennsylvania to buy a hamburger because the minimum wage in New Jersey is fifteen dollars at McDonald. They just buy it in New Jersey. <clears throat> Interesting. Uh Another cluster of questions is right up your alley. It's related to the, maybe it's a myth, or maybe it's, it's a, a truism that no longer exists, but the value of education. Uh, my parents and parents before them always gave top priority to trying to uh, have the opportunity for their kids to get a, not only just a basic education, but an advanced education. And of course, Many parents have paid tremendous amounts of money in high tuition bills and everything like that to help their kids, their tuition, uh, be able to um, fulfill their dreams uh, in, in, in terms of wherever they wanted to go with, with learning and with education. And as a matter of fact, for the, um, just to mention that for the Center for Critical Thinking, we're going to have a webinar uh, coming up on the student debt crisis and how serious that problem is. But the, the question essentially is, has that relationship between education and advancement broken down or is it no longer a relationship anymore? Uh, is it worth paying so much money to attend schools of higher learning at this stage? Or is it better just to maybe focus on becoming a plumber or uh, some other trade that, that pays very highly because there are few, so few of them? Well, all of that, of course, plays out in the in the market. Um, yes, I think lots of uh, what uh, happened in higher education is not really justifiable. It's the, the costs uh, of uh, the some of those extreme costs of getting a high, higher education degree are, I, in my estimation, out of line. Um, <clears throat> but it's what people are willing to pay to. Uh, to get those educations, it really drives that. Uh, we've, it's another whole topic, but obviously when the, the government's providing uh, <clears throat> scholarships and, and uh, support for uh, students, then it becomes a public uh, kind of a problem too. But there isn't any question. Now, another way to look at this, there's a simple way of looking at uh, how well off a country is. And, and we talk about per cap. Uh, how, how wealthy a country is basically is the number of people divided by the, the resources available to, the, to that country, right? Well, the, the reason that's a very complicated thing is people are also resources. And the more training and education they have, the more likely they are to be able to do things that other people are willing to pay them for, whether it's plumbing or uh, and, and of course, we know there's shortages of all kinds of skilled workers. They're a real, a real enigma, a real, a real uh, <laughs> mystery in society. We have all these high-paying 
fields. And because of attitudes that people have about, well, um, my son is going to do better with a, uh, a degree in some exotic major in college than a, uh, uh, than a plumber or an electrician, they go there. And so we're short of skilled, uh, skilled people. So that's what I think Jamie Dimon meant. It's certainly what I mean when I say we need to find where the needs are and then provide the incentives and, and, and uh, programs and, uh, to, to, uh, to deal with those uh, things that to help, to help solve some of those uh, problems. But for now, there's no question that education is something we value in our economic system. It shows up every day. I mean, people who, on the average, of course, have a college degree tend to, over a time, over a lifetime, make more money. And that's what we're really talking about here, mostly uh, today. So relating to public education um, and uh, particularly support for minority groups, um, have you found or have you seen in your research much of a correlation between the degree to which uh, uh, educational opportunities in the public schools uh, have been correlated with uh, performance uh, uh, later in life and the extent that if you were educated in a, an urban school which has a poor school system, perhaps there are teachers unions that are somehow involved in in homogenizing everything and not allowing um, uh, kids to advance no matter what they color. That, that tends to be a factor in and of itself that drives uh, uh, welfare uh, later in life. Is that, are you seeing any correlation there? I don't, I have not. Um, the, uh, I'm not sure what, what the question is there other than, um, is there, are there some schools that aren't very effective or some things we do in our schools that aren't very effective? I'm sure there, there are great uh, differences, but all we have are the, the aggregated statistics. We know if you graduate from high school, you're able to do whatever the high school has set with, for as a curriculum. You're going to do a little bit better than somebody who didn't finish. If well, only the because they didn't think finish. Chuck, I think that the, the impression um, that folks have maybe that dr is driving this question is that if you're a black or Hispanic uh, child in an urban school and receiving a fairly inferior education, I mean, you can see it in the Naples area, some, you know, the difference between some of the schools, some of them private, some of them public charter schools and all that sort of thing. You're already setting in place the foundations for an equity uh, because these kids are not getting a decent education. So if you don't address that, uh, is it like an automatic, you know, uh, inevitability? Yeah, but the question is, where do you begin to address it? I mean, there are lots of experiments in this book uh, that I uh, cited a couple of times <clears throat> about expectations that people have derived from where they are when they grow up. And there's, there are all kinds of studies. They follow people who move. Uh, they've actually done experiments where they've given people subsidies and let people move from areas where the schools and the neighborhoods were poor uh, into one that's not a lot richer, but a little bit better off. And then follow those kids all the way through their lives and they find they make more money. They, they don't get divorces as often. Uh, all of the life, um, the, the attributes or the qualities of life uh, go up simply because they got out of where they were. And how do you account for the whole gestalt of a, you know, where you are? Is it, is it how the parents are there? That the parents don't uh, follow up to make sure the kids are doing what they're supposed to do based on what the schools are telling them they need to do, but they're not getting any support at home? Um, is it about expectations? Um, Somehow that has, it, it's almost like raising yourself up by bootstraps. It's where do you get a hold of the strap? <laughs> and what do you fix first? Uh, and it all has to do somehow with opportunity and actually with the feeling that you have an opportunity somehow. If you don't feel like, you feel like no matter what I do, I'm gonna end up this way. I'm gonna have to make part of my income selling drugs or 
some other way because I'm never going to make better than seven dollars and a quarter an hour. Um, so we, we have to be smart enough and figure out how to tackle this broadly and find the right bootstraps to lift up all of the all the people, especially those at the very bottom and say, I didn't want to get on. I don't want to go there. Well, why don't they? So in other words, it's an upstream problem somewhere that you, you have to fix. Um, not going to be easy. Obviously, we've been trying. We have to continue to try. So if you, if you which I think President Biden is trying to do, uh, pursue a policy of, uh, of trying to bring jobs back, back home to the United States, um, try to uh, work uh, to um, have companies uh, uh, offer uh, decent wages, and, but you've mentioned that Amazon has done that. And to what extent are they simply passing their costs on to us, which is an indirect form of taxation, I guess. Um, but do you, see, do you see any hope on the horizon that um, it's not just gonna be a tit for tat, you raise the wage, companies uh, just charge more or raise their costs, but you know, we, we actually can see a process of people moving up the ladder as it were. Well, <clears throat> again, it's extremely complex, but you know, if you move up the ladder at some point, you actually, you actually develop more of what you can sell either through your ability as it evolves, through experience, through additional education, um, you become a resource and not a draw on the, on the treasury. Um, I, I know uh, <clears throat> I did, going back to personal experience back in the, uh, the day when I had a father trying to uh, figure out how to send six uh, sons to college. And at the time it was my turn, I was the oldest, to go, we had $450, I think, in savings bonds. <clears throat> so the, the challenge was, okay, how do we take this money and get an education for everybody? Well, the federal government helped us all a little bit through some, through some loans, through some scholarships. And uh, of my uh, six, five brothers, uh, all of them got college degrees even though my father probably couldn't have afforded to do that ever. So they all became productive citizens, teachers, uh, school administrators, uh, all kinds of roles in society where they were well paid and they did something for society and they were part of it. They felt good. We all felt good. At one point, the government uh, said to me, uh, we, uh, we just noticed that the Russians put Sputnik up. This is how old I am. Uh, and that indicates we're behind in the space race. So we're going to actually pay a, a lot of kids who have some ability or interest in this field to go to college and get a degree in science. So there was this federal program. It was called the National Defense Education Act. And the, the country was saying, we want to get ahead in the space race. So we're going to pay your tuition, your books, uh, and whatever it takes to get you to be a science guy, scientist. And they did that for thousands of kids. And of course, you know the rest of the story. We beat the Russians to the, to the moon. It worked, right? But all, the, all of us, I, I one time uh, thought, well, if I didn't take that deal uh, and stayed at, uh, as a high school biology teacher, and looked at my what my salary would have been over the 40 years of a career versus what it was as a school administrator or re scientific researcher. <clears throat> I probably ended up paying, I don't know, 100 times more taxes <laughs> than I would have if they didn't help. In other words, it, it actually didn't cost the government anything, really. If you could look at, uh, look at it instead of at that, time at the beginning when they were actually writing the check, <clears throat> but look at it over a lifetime of the person they helped, then it's another thing altogether. And it's a payoff for our society uh, when you actually help somebody develop to the point where they're a productive citizen, not in jail, not drawing on uh, 
uh, public assistance because they don't have a place, but they're actually a contributing member of society. We have to work harder at that. It works. We just have to work harder at making it happen. So why don't we allow um, time for a couple more questions, which I'll try to try to cluster here. Um, I'm going to read one because uh, I think it's a little bit um, complex, but also profound. I've been asked by teenagers with Republican parents, generally Trump supporters, why I'd be a Democrat since I have given uh, much of my salary away after working hard for that money. Why would I want to support people who are not working? It's difficult to explain our reasoning to teenagers or college students getting ready to move into the job market. Why should it be their problem? This is difficult to explain to a young person. What, what kind of answers would you provide or do you provide to this sort of question? I don't, I don't have the answer. I know that the answer is we have, to, we have to address that problem somehow. Those that have the ability to, to get on the track of becoming productive citizens, we have to find a way to get them set that way, get them on that track. I don't think anybody is for paying people not to work. Um, unless it's an absolute last uh, hope that they're gonna die unless you help them. And we all would, most of us human beings would step in at that point <clears throat> and try to help if we, if we could. But no, I, I think the, the idea of paying people <clears throat> programs like the earned income tax credit program for the American government, for example, even libertarians like it because <clears throat> the premise is if you, you're not really just giving people a dole, here's some money because you don't have any. What you do is you, you, you only give it, you only give this break to people who actually have a job, <clears throat> but because they have two children and their job doesn't pay very well, they get kind of a negative tax benefit. If they, they first their taxes are reduced if, it's, if their income isn't very high. And then finally, they get actually a cash payment to bring it up to some level where they can make a living and remain productive doing the job they already have, but continue to do it. So it's little, it's, it's, it's things like that. And I say little because it's a hundred billion dollar uh, program. One of, one of we, we, we already spend, I take it, I get it. But, we already spend about half of our federal budget on, uh, on programs of social welfare. Uh, so health programs for people, social security, if you include social security and Medicare, Medicaid, <clears throat> food stamps, all those programs, it's, way, it's probably half of our uh, federal budget. So we as a country are already trying to, to do, take care of uh, people. But as Jamie Dimon says, we have to be more effective in finding places for people to get on that first rung of the ladder and then help them uh, move on up. So this is the, a cluster for the of questions for, for the final question to you, Chuck. Um, and there are probably some, 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 some elements here. Uh, I think in response to um, the earlier question to you about what to tell your young people and that sort of thing, one of the one of the things that to me is is a travesty in our system, and I'm just making a, a comment here and an observation, is that it, it, it does appear that there are many highly profitable corporations that are not paying their fair share of taxes, or are actually even paying taxes at all. Um, and if that's the impression that the majority um, of people in the lower rungs of society have they're not going to be very impressed by either our system or by our culture that's condoning or supporting these sorts of practices with, with for example, what, what happened in the previous administration with tax cuts and things like that. So uh, in this domain, how do we change the culture of America uh, that seems to believe in indiv individual success and blames people for their own poverty? Is that, is that even possible? And is it possible to put in uh, place a safety net that supports your ability to work and includes um, daycare and, and a livable minimum wage and health care support? Or, or is that just a dream that's beyond our, beyond our reach at this point? And then lastly, as you, as you look at um, corporate salaries, 
which are one of the most dramatic examples of inequity sometimes. Uh, you talked about, you know, 100, one 360th of a pizza pie being for weight. What, how do you, I mean, do you see any correlation be, between uh, higher CEO pay and, and their actual performance? Or is this just a gravy train that they've hopped on and, and are getting tremendous amounts of money for uh, separation payments even and that sort of thing with, with very little to show for it? Well, I, I've seen no nothing that I would call proof <clears throat> that paying a CEO uh, 360 times more than a worker makes provide it gets you some kind of a difference uh, in the bottom line. Now, one of the experiments in that book I cited uh, had to do with sports teams, um, and I didn't get into it, but I will now just to point out that the study was. What about sports teams that have great disparity in how much they pay the mem team members of the team? And what they found was there was no correlation between the disparity, which is a measure of superstar pay, pay because that's what would create this biggest, uh, uh, biggest difference. <clears throat> there was no correlation between the extreme difference between uh, paying your players uh, and outcome. Uh, in fact, the, the, the teams with the greatest inequity had the worst records. Now, ironically, they had they 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 actually brought in more fans <laughs> for if you if you if you tried to control for win loss. I mean, people come to see winners too. But if you tried to control for that, paying those you know those superstar players brought more fans in. So it, it did have some kind of an effect on the bottom line, but that obviously doesn't apply one for one to the CEO of a company. Nobody, nobody buys something or a company because it happens to have a superstar CEO. Is the product any good? And uh, do they stand by their uh, uh, products when something goes wrong with them? Uh, and does it help me in my life, make it easier in some way? We don't, we don't even know who those CEOs are. So I'd have to see the proof. I mean, I don't know why it would be the other way around. We'd have to prove that it doesn't work. It's these are decisions that boards of um, boards of directors make about what they're going to pay a, a CEO. Um, and I know there's some pressure on them now to watch that because, you know, especially uh, companies that have products that are thought to be overpriced. And then you look and see what the CEO is making, and some poor, poor lady who can't make, you can't buy the drug she needs to keep alive. Uh, but the CEO is making thirty million dollars a year plus stock options. Now, so they know it's a PR thing. So I think we need to, to uh, make that a little more visible. What are these people being paid, and what's the justification for it? Because, you know, some way or other, the the people who buy these products. Are paying those salaries, so if we didn't pay them, wouldn't my wouldn't the price be a little lower? But right now, I think they're just not visible to people. They're not going to take that into account because there's no way even to find out what a CEO makes unless uh, you know. In, in some cases, that's not that information is not even available. So we have to we have to we have to uh, show that for what it is somehow, and. Maybe follow the example of companies. I know there's some now that have, where the CEO has said, I'm not gonna take that kind of pay. I'm going to take uh, quite a bit less. And here's what I'm gonna do with the difference. And they've got a lot of PR value from it. Whether that continues to play that way or not, I don't know, but it looked to me like a, uh, uh, like it was, it was encouraging to see some of them recognize this was a uh, accountability problem. Well, thank you very much. There's there's a lot of food for thought here, and probably, um, I mean, we really only touched upon how uh, climate change may impact our our society as well, and the the degree to which it could trigger major movements of population. I mean, we're already seeing in Florida a tremendous surge of people moving here, um, and uh, the degree to which 
our culture is under stress. People are not seeing elements of fairness that they have come to expect to be a central tenet of our value system here in the United States and the degree to which we're seeing these tremendous inequities in people's welfare um, when there are certain standards that, that they are expecting in, in, in their lives and uh, never thought that they would be so impoverished. But of course, you know, we, we deal with all these uh, variables of COVID-19 and uh, other factors that are at work um, to help um, perhaps exacerbate these trends. But your talk has, I think, given us all hope that, um, that it can be tackled. It's, uh, it's not a kleptocracy. We're not, we're not an aristocracy at this point. There, is, there are some central elements of our democracy and of our capitalist system that um, <clears throat> exist that will help us be able to effectively address these issues. And, and so with that, Dr. Kupchala, I thank you very much for a very interesting and provocative conversation and presentation. Thank you, Alan, I enjoyed it. Uh, thank all of you that were in on the uh, program today. I, I appreciate the honor and the privilege of uh, making the presentation. Thank you.